Um, I think if I had to pick one place in North America to think about uh, the translation and transmission of Milarepa and the life of Milarepa in the West and in North America, it would probably be in Boulder. Um, you have a long history here uh, going back, as you all know, um, and it just seems somehow just so thoroughly appropriate to be talking about uh, some of my work about Milarepa and the kind of uh, uh, the thinking that I've done about uh, the life story and the reading and the writing of that life story with you all. So it really is a great pleasure to be here. So I'm not going to actually read from the new book that came out, The Yogan and the Madman, but I want to give you, uh, present some of the ideas that I've thought about in the book together in a framework that gives you an idea of I don't know, maybe some, some new ways of thinking about a figure in a literary tradition I know many of you are already familiar with. It's nice to be speaking about Milarepa in, uh, for, in, in, in front of such an educated and sophisticated audience for things Tibetan. So late in the 11th century, a wandering mendicant, the yogin, starved himself in the frigid mountains of southern Tibet while undertaking ascetic practice. He lived in solitude on a diet of boiled nettles, and his skin turned green as a result. He's said to have become a Buddha, a perfect teacher who was also famous for his poetry and songs of spiritual realization. 400 years later, a tantric adept emerged from the jungles of Tibet's border with Northeast India. Naked, human entrails wound around his dangling dreadlocks. This adept, the madman, composed a new and novelistic version of the yogin's life, and the story it told of a great Tibetan saint would inspire new forms of religious literature across uh, the Himalayan world, new styles of artistic production, new traditions of spiritual practice. And in time, the madman's version of the yogin's life would become Tibet's most famous book. But it was also the first Tibetan book translated into a European language. In the 1930s, Romanian sculptor and leader of the modernist scene in Paris, Constantine Bracouche, read and quoted from the story often, and he said to have believed himself to be an incarnation of the Tibetan saint. In 1962, British physician uh, Lawrence Michael Dillon published a condensed account of the yogin's life under the pen name Lobsang Jivaka. Dillon was also a transsexual and the first to undergo female to male sex reassignment surgery. And it seems that his experience with the fluid nature of self-identity led him to embrace the Buddhist idea of no self that was exemplified in the yogin's biography. So the yogin who you see here uh, is Milarepa, uh, whose name literally means he clad in white cotton robes of the Mila clan. And his vita is simply but ubiquitously known as the life of Milarepa. And if you haven't read it, I'll make a plug for my new English translation called The Life of Milarepa in the Penguin Classics series. Milarepa's biographical tradition encompasses an enormous body of Tibetan literature, yet this literary tradition has been overshadowed by the activities of a single remarkable figure, writing some four centuries after the yogin's death, the madman named Tsongyun Haruka, whose name means in its Tibetan rendering, blood drinker, the madman of Western Tibet. So we have here, oh, and I should say in, in general, I have some slides to show you. Uh, they're really just kind of eye candy for you to have something to look at while I'm speaking to you. So. But we have here uh, the subject, the 11th century Yogin Milarepa, and the author, four centuries later, madman Tsongyun Haruka. And I'll just point out uh, that the uh, images you see here are from the earliest extant woodblock uh, carving of Tsongyun Haruka's edition of The Life of Milarepa. So here we have the subject, the 11th century yogin Milarepa, and the author, four centuries later, Madman Sanyan Haruka. And it was the Madman's literary works, an extensive biography of Milarepa, The Life, and a separate anthology of his poetry, The Collected Songs, that would form the most authoritative record of the yogin's deeds, a canonical measure against which all other representations would be judged. And it's clear that the madman's representation formed the yogin's enduring image, one sustained for centuries in monasteries across the Himalaya and now taught in religious studies classrooms across North America. The narrative has been described as a singular masterpiece of world literature, 
with its subject Milarepa recognized not only as Tibet's preeminent saint, but also the, quote, Socrates of Asia, or the, quote, Abraham Lincoln of the Himalaya. <laughs> Wasn't me who said that. So my book, uh, titled after these two central characters, The Yogin and the Madman, began with a simple question. How and why did the story take shape in a way that was compelling to readers both medieval and modern, to Tibetans and Boulderites alike, although I recognize that the latter categories are no longer mutually exclusive? So to answer that question, the book interrogates the changing relationships between dozens of Tibetan texts, narratives, and representations produced over some four centuries from earliest fragments to the canonical version of the late 15th century. It thus illuminates the various forms in which the Yogan's life story has been reimagined and rewritten in the context of the broader historical and religious conditions that allowed for such forms of literary production. So in doing so, it questions how sacred lives are recorded and transmitted, how their structures and functions change over time, and how their changing forms uh, affects the reading of their content. So today, I present uh, just one small piece of this literary puzzle, a new way of reading the life of Milarepa, and perhaps other sacred biographies as well, by foregrounding the process through which the narrative took shape, together with the discursive tactics the, the author employed to effectively transform his text from a kind, uh, in, into a kind of literary relic. So to understand the text as a form of literary relic, I've imagined Milarepa's narrative tradition as forming a kind of physical body, that is the literary corpus as a physical corpse, and that's one of the central kind of metaphors of the book. So you have this vast collection of literature, a literary corpus, and trying to imagine this as a kind of physical body as a physical corpse. Milarepa's 12th century death brought with it a biographic birth, and soon the life story was repeated and rewritten. Its authors began suturing together the narratives of his biography, and as they did so, an image of the yogin came into view, first skeletal, later incorporating more complex literary structures as sinews binding the body together. Comprehensive accounts later added layers of flesh, forming an increasingly lifelike representation, until finally late in the 15th century, like Pygmalion's Galatea from the cold grain of ivory, Milarepa's portrait embodied in the madman's creation was animated and brought to life. So in turn, I have imagined myself as adopting a kind of biographical forensics, dissecting the literary corpus to reveal its underlying structures and explore their systemic relationships through which and around which the body coalesced. So uh, this evening I'll, I'll begin with a very brief account of Milarepa's early fragmentary biographical tradition, but quickly turn to reading uh, the canonical version in light of the relationship posited by the tradition between madman and yogin. After introducing the madman's early career, uh, turn to his status, that is the madman's status, as the yogin's reincarnation, that is as the recognized re-embodiment of Milarepa, hundreds of years after the yogin's death. And I'll conclude uh, with a close reading of the text's narrative frame uh, in, in light of this conflation of subject and author. So the madman I show employs the rhetoric of traditional Buddhist scriptures to effectively write himself into the story, not as a competing subject, but literally as the subject himself. And from this ultimate vantage point, the yogin's first person narration becomes the madman's own voice, unimpeachable and seemingly unmediated, as if speaking out directly to readers across a span of some four centuries. So the life of Milarepa concludes with the following vignette describing events following the yogin's death. And the image that you're looking at here is from a really wonderful and rare illuminated manuscript of uh, Milarepa's life story, not from the canonical version, not from Sonia Haruka's version, but from a much earlier version, although the manuscript itself um, was created, I think, in the, in the 18th century. But what you're witnessing here, the, the image is, is showing you the cremation of Milarepa. At the, uh, just after the time of his death. So the life of Milarepa concludes with the following vignette 
describing the events following the yogin's death. Dawn breaks on the morning after Milarepa's cremation, and one of his longtime followers awakens from a wondrous but disheartening dream. Celestial maidens, or dakinis, were carrying off his master's mortal remains in the form of a radiant sphere of light. Anxious, he rouses his fellow disciples, and together they peer into the cremation cell, only to find the chamber is empty. Neither ashes nor bone remains. Gone too are the sacred pearl-like relics, causing even greater dismay. Celestial goddesses, it seems, had swept clean the yogin's every physical trace, leaving, uh, leaving nothing behind. And this is really a crucial element in the story here, um, and which suggests that uh, Milarepa's human disciples were deemed to be unfit to retain the yogin's physical remains or his relics. So it's an important point of the story that his disciples had no relics uh, of, of their teacher. So heartbroken, the assembly instead inherits his few worldly possessions, a cap, a walking staff, or strips of his cotton robe. But in addition to these everyday items, Milarepa's uh, followers and patrons also kept stories of his life, his travels, his ascetic practices, his poetry. And if the yogin's mortal remains had vanished from sight, his life would take shape once again through the gradual recording and reworking of these accounts. What might have first decomposed was eventually recomposed through the gradual codification of his biographical corpus. And this corpus emerged first in, uh, as rudimentary outlines. So these were narrative fragments recorded, uh, it seems, by early disciples and perhaps written down within a generation after his passing in the late 12th century. They resemble notes hastily scribbled and have almost none of the formal properties of sacred biography as it came to be understood in Tibet. Over time, uh, the skeletal frame was fleshed by a new genre of literature, uh, what I refer to as a kind of proto-biography, assembling narrative elements of prose and poetry within the tight constraints of a rigid literary structure. Such works were brief, and the format lent itself to the creation of collective biographies known as golden rosaries, or sertang, an important genre of Tibetan writing that records genealogies of discrete religious lineages from their point of origin down to the time of writing. Now, in many cases, such works, uh, such works advance the sectarian agenda of legitimating a master by documenting his, and occasionally her, unbroken link to an authentic source of the Buddhist teachings. Now, beginning perhaps in the early 13th century, a new form of life writing emerged that began to model the body. And this is what I refer to as the biographical compendium. These were comprehensive repositories of biographical minutia that sometimes range into hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, and for the first time, they began to anthologize the yogin's poetry within extensive networks of song cycles. So this then brings us to the canonical version completed by the madman in 1488, three years after Sir Thomas Mallory published La Morte d'Arthur, and uh, shortly after Da Vinci drew his designs for his aerial screw. Much could be said by way of literary analysis of the life and songs, and if you want the long version, you can read the book. Uh, but here I want to just emphasize a couple of points. First, uh, the madman was the first author to divide the life story and poetry anthology into autonomous works. He also transformed the third person narrative into a first person exposition, and more about this in a moment. But the madman was also a skilled literary stylist who fashioned his account with richer thematic development and greater sophistication in plotting and pacing than had ever been seen previously. The madman drew upon a vast archive of biographical documents to craft a story that was at once captivating and poignant. But I want to turn now to representations of the madman Sonyan Haruka himself as author and of his role as the literary and perhaps the literal voice of the yogin's biographical tradition. The late 15th century was a defining moment for Milarepa's life, even though he had been dead for almost 400 years. It was a period of both civil unrest and religious expansion in central Tibet. Tsongyan Haruka, who was born in 1452, thus entered a world that was consumed by regional and sectarian conflict. 
Uh, he also appeared during a period that has been characterized as an age of fervent religious reform. He later formed part of a tradition of unconventional figures known as religious madmen, that is Nyumba, from which his name stems. And uh, he thereby advocated a movement, however symbolic, away from the rising tide of corporate religion back to the solitary itinerant yogin, an ideal upon which Milarepa's own religious tradition was founded. Tsongyun Haruka was ordained as a monk at a young age, but at 21, having given away his robes and possessions, and uh, following Milarepa's example, he spent years in solitary retreat in the mountain wilderness of southern Tibet. He's described as having quickly achieved the power of inner yogic heat that is marked by the ability to wear nothing but a single cotton robe, even in the frigid winter snow. And it was during this period of intense contemplative practice that he adopted the lifestyle of a mad yogin for which he became famous. And one passage from uh, his own biography, that is the madman's biography, describes him in the, in the following way. So this is Tsongyin Haruka's own biography. Upon his naked body, he rubbed human ashes, daubs of blood, and smears of human grease. He wore a necklace of intestines from human corpses and made ornaments of its hands and feet. He cut off the fingers and toes and tied them together with thread and bound them into his hair. And there are many, many such uh, descriptions of him. And the image here of such uh, an antinomian figure originates in the adepts of medieval Indian Buddhism from the 7th to the 11th centuries. Such figures were famous for their transgressive behavior in the practice of Tantra, but they also gained tremendous status even at the margins of society as holders of powerful transmission lines of Buddhism. The madman spent much of his life literally following in Milarepa's footsteps, wandering among his mountain retreats and meditating in his caves. Tsangyin Haruka later carried out a number of major literary projects, but it's the record of his work on the life of Milarepa that receives the place of prominence in all of his own biographies. In 1488, Tsangyin's composition was complete. And in doing so, he had targeted an audience far broader than had previously existed for such narratives. And he imagined that his works would circulate as an independent literary tradition, reaching political elites, religious virtuosi, and ordinary individuals alike. The author was plagued by political distractions and financial hardship, but with patronage from the royal courts of southern Tibet, he was able to produce for the first time xylographic prints of the life story. And in doing so, Tsangyin Haruka uh, was riding a growing wave of technological innovation of wood, uh, as woodblock printing was adopted into mainstream use in central Tibet only about half a century earlier. The madman also proved himself uh, shrewd in, the promotion in, in his work's promotion and distribution, joining uh, his new texts with related visual, ritual, and liturgical materials, commencing what may have been one of Tibet's first concerted multimedia approaches to life writing. The legacy of his efforts is witnessed perhaps most clearly in the printing history of his versions of the life of Milarepa, uh, where altogether we know of at least 19 separate woodblock print editions, making this, I suspect, one of the most widely reprinted biographical works in Tibet's already exceptionally bibliophilic history. When Sonyan Haruka concludes uh, his version of Milarepa's life, he affixed neither his ordination name nor the epithet Madman of Tsang or Tsang Nyun. And this led to some confusion on the part of early European scholars who referred to the life story either as an autobiography written by Milarepa's own hand or dictated by him and recorded by a disciple scribe as an eyewitness, as a kind of eyewitness account. And it was not until the first English translation of Milarepa's collected poetry, which was only published in 1962, that the author was correctly identified. Now, the confusion over who authored the life and songs, which was admittedly largely a problem among non-Tibetan commentators, uh, was certainly understandable. Although the life story is clearly titled in Tibetan a biography, that is a namtar, as opposed to a self-written life story, a rangnam, it takes the structural form of an autobiography narrated in the first person. 
The Madman switched to a first-person narrative, certainly made for compelling literature, but it also invested the text with a sheen of authenticity, as if capturing the life of the subject himself in his very own words. And this was an unprecedented move within Milarepa's biographical tradition, and perhaps uh, Tibetan literature more broadly. Yet the correspondence of author and subject lies deeper still. The first person narrative was not merely a literary conceit, but rather underscored a direct relationship between the yogin and madman, first prompted by the author himself and later promoted by his followers. The life of Milarepa, therefore, may also be understood as an autobiographical voice set within a biographical frame. This is a situation that creates an utter conflation of self and other, one that is, I think, less Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe than Gertrude Stein's autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. And it is in this sense, with the yogin's life a vehicle for the madman's self-reflection, and the madman's identification with the yogin serving to authorize the life that the underlying mechanism of this biographical act might be understood. And it was through this act that a biographical corpus, 400 years in the making, was effectively brought to life. And so what I want to do with the rest of the talk here is to try and describe the mechanisms through which this kind of vivification uh, took place. The madman is credited with the traditional Buddhist motivations for crafting his version of Milarepa's life story, that is, spreading the Buddha's doctrine and thereby benefiting innumerable beings. But the madman's own biography describes yet another rationale when he's credited with the following reflection. So Tsongning is thinking to himself here, quote, at present in the snowy land of Tibet, there exist numerous biographies and collected songs of Jetson Milarepa. However, the transmission of his extraordinary biography has been interrupted. Now, the notion of an extraordinary biography, somehow qualitatively distinct from early versions, is a central concern here and one that I'll return to. What might constitute such a work to distinguish it from other forms of life writing, and in particular, to other versions of the yogin's life? Well, one contemporary Tibetan critic has described the formation of the extraordinary biography in the following way. He theorizes, the yogin's close disciples composed biographical bits and pieces, Torbu, based upon what they saw and heard, but after 400 years, the extraordinary biography had become interrupted or lost. Those parts that were not lost or corrupted with various kinds, uh, those parts that were not lost were corrupted with various kinds of misinformation so that they became untrustworthy and ineffective. In contrast, the madman's version of the yogin's life, he goes on, uh, came to be viewed as pure and precise in its representation, reclaiming a true account of the yogin's life from a landscape of exaggerated and misreported claims. And in some ways, this seems to model uh, the, the, the search for a kind of authentic Buddhism uh, that we found in the late 18 and early 1900s um, that goes back to the voice of the Buddha himself, whereas later traditions, especially Buddhist traditions in Tibet, were a kind of later development, a sort of accretion of cultural and ritual practices, things like that, um, that still somewhere un underneath retained a kind of core of the true doctrine. So there's a similar idea uh, at work here. So uh, Tsongyan Haruka's uh, work was understood uh, to be one that appeared to capture Milarepa's life in its living flesh. And the assumption here might be that the madman had access to rare materials, either oral or written, that somehow illuminated the past more clearly. However, uh, an, an uh, analysis of the literary corpus reveals a very different kind of picture. The madman based nearly his entire narrative on previous extant sources, in many cases drawing upon them verbatim. So basically what this means is that the entire text of Tsongyan Haruka's version of the life of Milarepa is based upon earlier extant sources. So we would say that uh, he drew upon them if you're being polite. You could say that he lifted them writ large uh, if you were not. Descriptions of Tsongyan Haruka's works as extraordinary 
thus refers not to the content of the text so much as it does the means by which it was authorized. And the process of making pure the impure or making true the untrue refers less to editorial technique than to the specific claims that Sonia Haruka and later his followers could make about his relationship to the subject of his text. The Madman's extraordinary biography of Milarepa does not merely consist of some other version or combination of versions pieced together in a more compelling manner, although that description may not be wholly inaccurate. Rather, it refers to the Madman's direct knowledge of the life, not as an author working from secondary sources generations after the fact, not even as a direct witness to accounts, but as the biographical subject himself. The fame the madman received upon finishing the life and songs earned him the status of Milarepa's re-embodiment on earth, a status he advocated himself and one promoted by his followers. So thus, uh, we shall see how Tsongyun's biography of Milarepa can be read in part as his own biography, an autobiographical biography, a life within a life. Now, we don't have time here for a detailed discussion of the broad political, social, and economic implications of the recognized reincarnation or tulku system uh, carried in Tibet. And I'm sure that many of you already know a good deal about this. But we can say, as one might expect, there were ample opportunities for excess and abuse. Indeed, the overarching grip that the reincarnation system held on Tibetan religion and politics seems to have been one of the madman's principal targets in advocating a return to the simpler tradition of the wandering ascetic. At the same time, however, it quickly becomes clear that the madman and his followers freely adopted the image of the reincarnation as a means for legitimating his authorial voice. As recorded in the tradition, Tsongyin Haruka's religious career was punctuated by visionary encounters of Milarepa. So at age 26, uh, the madman journeys to one of Milarepa's famous retreat sites in southern Tibet. And at that story, uh, the madman's own biography records, I'm quoting here, while abiding evenly in the state of river flow samadhi for one month, Milarepa would appear and sometimes give compassionate advice. Sometimes he would teach dharma, sometimes he would display miracles, and sometimes he would narrate his life story. So from Milarepa himself then, the madman is understood as receiving not only religious teachings and advice, but a direct transmission of the yogin's life story from his own biographical subject. If the madman merely hinted about his status as Milarepa's re-embodiment during his life, on his deathbed, he reaffirmed it in no uncertain terms. In his final instructions given to followers just before par uh, passing away, he proclaims, monks and disciples, together with my patrons, you have directly met Milarepa himself during this degenerate age, and so you have good karma and excellent fortune. Moreover, look at, Miller look at Milarepa's life, his namtar, and equate your life with practice. Now the last part of that statement has always kind of perplexed me. Look at Milarepa's life, his numtar has kind of two meanings. One, think about Milarepa's life and deeds. Obviously he's thinking about himself as Milarepa as well. But the term that's used is numtar, so in effect he's saying, look at the story of Milarepa that I've just written, right? And use that as a basis for your practice. So summarizing, his own life, Tsongyin Haruka's own life, in these final moments, the madman turns to the figure of Milarepa, presenting himself as the yogin incarnate, returned to the world for the benefit of beings during the period of degeneration and decline. So having established the relation posited by the tradition between the yogin and the madman, uh, we can now turn to the text itself and a closer reading of the narrative frame it employs. And I ap apologize in advance, this is the one little sort of technical part of this talk that draws upon some kind of buddhological ideas, the most buddhological part of this talk. Virtually all of Milarepa's early biographies open with a humble description of the yogin's origins. The madman, however, introduces his version with an extensive narrative frame that opens in the following way. So this is the beginning of the life of Milarepa that he wrote. Thus have I heard, 
At one time, the powerful Lord of Yogins, the great Haruka himself, greatly renowned as Jetsun Milarepa, was residing in the sacred place of the Belly Cave in the region of Nyenam, turning the wheel of the great vehicle Dharma, seated in the middle of his heart disciple Yogins, and what follows is a long list of human and non-human disciples. So the scene that unfolds here clearly mirrors the canonical literature of Indian Buddhism. The passage uh, begins with the formula, thus have I heard, repeating the words in their uh, Sanskrit rendering, evam maya shrutam, attributed to the Buddha's faithful attendant, Ananda, and intended to reflect his perfect recitation from memory, the Buddha's teachings at the first monastic council. Now in the context of the early Buddhist discourses called sutras, these words are meant to describe the text as a kind of eyewitness record of what the Buddha actually taught, and thus project upon it an authority reserved for, for the canonical word of the Buddha. Now in the Indian commentarial literature about uh, this, th this kind of language, uh, the words, thus have I heard, have been glossed as the scriptural opening. So the opening is a technical term here. And the remainder of the passage uh, that begins with at one time forms what's known as the text's setting. And this describes where the discourse was given and who was in attendance. Now many Buddhist discourses establish the elements of the setting with a statement, a kind of almost a generic statement such as at one time the Bhagavan was abiding in Vulture Peak in Rajgriha with a great assembly of monks and a great assembly of bodhisattvas and so on. In the passage here, however, the madman adopt, uh, adapts this format to suit his own dramatis personae. The place is identified as belly cave, while the teacher, Milarepa, is discoursing on the Mahayana doctrine to a marvelous retinue consisting of his close disciples and a host of human and non-human devotees. Later in the episode, his disciple Rachungba is inspired by a miraculous dream to request that Milarepa recount his life story. And in this case, the disciple is cast uh, in the role often played by another of the Buddha's followers, Shariputra, who often serves as the actor who inspires the Buddha to, to, uh, to teach. So Milarepa then proceeds to narrate the deeds of his life, and this is what constitutes the main body of the text of the life of Milarepa. Buddhist commentarial literature has further discussed the identification of the I in Thus Have I Heard. This individual is described as the rapporteur, another technical term here, the Samgiti Kartra, referring to this individual's various activities from the marker of the Buddha's word, the leader of its public recitation, and the convener of the council to determine its content, that is, from speaker to reciter to redactor. And in Tibetan, he's called the gatherer of the Buddha's words, the Ka Dupapo. And in this sense, he's the speaker, the reciter, and the redactor of the Buddha's authentic speech. In the Buddha's discourses, this individual is frequently, although not always, uh, identified as Ananda. And his identification as such, as rapporteur, uh, carried deep implications about how and why and when and for whom such teachings were given, especially in the context of later Mahayana works. Now, as I not noted earlier, Many of those who first read the life of Milarepa outside Tibet understood the speaker of Thus Have I Heard, the I in Thus Have I Heard, to be the yogin's close disciple, Rachungba, leading them to attribute the entire biography to him. But the rapporteur's voice, I believe, may also uh, may be equally understood as belonging to the madman Tsongyun Haruga himself. The author universally equated in Tibet with gathering and preserving not the Buddha's word, but Milarepa's collected words, that is Milarepa's kabu. In the view of traditional Indian commentators, the opening, thus have I heard, identifies the rapporteur's eyewitness experience of the teaching, while the setting, at one time, functions primarily to authorize him as a kind of reliable person, uh, that is a valid source. So what does it mean that the madman himself can state, thus have I heard, a phrase meant to imply his status as eyewitness about the words of an individual who lived some four centuries earlier? 
unlike the late Indian Buddhist writers who were forced to adopt uh, complex strategies of interpretation and legitimation to defend their works as Buddha vachana, that is Buddha voiced or canonical, long after the Buddha's demise, uh, the approach adopted by the madman in his biographers was fairly straightforward. So he concludes his colophon to the life of Milarepa by stating, Although I have seen many biographies of Milarepa, I, the one dressed in bone ornaments, that's an epithet he uses for himself, the yogin who wanders in charnel grounds, put, into writing, put this into writing perfectly and completely, just as it was recounted by an extraordinary master. As we've seen, the madman was indeed described as having received at age 26 the direct transmission of Milarepa's life story through a visionary encounter with the yogin. So from the perspective of the madman's own, own biographical tradition, at least, he not only read early accounts of Milarepa's life story, he actually heard it from the guru's own mouth. And yet, the madman's direct experience of the yogin's life story was described as extending deeper still. He not only heard the life story in vision, but as the yogin's re-embodiment, he lived it himself. So in this way, Tsang Yun may have written his account with himself serving as the I of the life's thus have I heard. The content of what he heard, designated thus, would refer to the extraordinary biography. A version of the life story extraordinary, not so much in terms of its content, but in the means through which it was authorized. That is, through its delivery by a so-called extraordinary master. Now, in this case, the tradition could claim that Song Yun formulated his extraordinary biography in two ways. First, through the transmission by this extraordinary master, in the case Milarepa himself, but also through the author's direct knowledge of the life as the incarnation of his biographical subject. And this, then, establishes two distinct but interrelated literary frames within the text. The inner frame forms the principal life story as an autobiographical reflection. A description of Milarepa's deeds as narrated by the yogin, beginning with an account of his early life up to the time of his death. The text's outer frame, including the opening, the setting, and their subsequent narrative, as well as the description of Milarepa's death, suggests that the story is told through the voice of the madman as author and rapporteur, long after the yogin's passing. Yet the story's inner and outer frames are closely related, and it is the text's introduction that defines the relationship between the two. By opening his work, his, his work with the words, Thus have I heard, Tsang Yun Haruka is not merely mimicking the standard literary conceit of scriptural legitimation. He's locating his own position vis-a-vis -vis the text. As biographer, the madman can claim to record the life as a witness to Milarepa's own words. As his own biographical subject, he speaks as the agent of the life itself. Okay, so to conclude, what I've shown here is the process through which the madman took a biography that had become increasingly lifelike and effectively brought it to life. And he did so in a number of ways through positing his close association with Milarepa by means of visionary experience, but also through his direct identification as Milarepa himself. He thereby gained an authorial voice, presented as a self-reflection in the first person, that then eclipsed some four centuries of previous textual production. The madman's own work became the canonical version of the yogin's life, and indeed it stands as the most famous and successful attempt to write a sutra, that is, a canonical Buddhist discourse in Tibetan with a Tibetan person in the role of the Buddha. The result is a text that itself is worthy of worship and veneration, much like that of a powerful saintly relic. And indeed, in his colophon, the author extols the virtuous reward gained by those who read the life of Milarepa, but also for those who hear it, see it, recollect it, preserve it, or even touch it. The pioneer of Buddhist studies, Etienne Lamotte, once wrote that writing the life of the historical Buddha is a hopeless enterprise. And we can empathize with Lamotte's lament, much as we can with the dejected historian Antoine Rocantin's pursuit of his own biographical subject in Sartre's epistolary novel, Nausea.
Despite the fact that he's commonly referred to as the historical Buddha, there is little that we can claim to know directly about the Sakya prince. That is, uh, be it details of his life or the content of his teaching. In a similar way, Milarepa left no record of his life, and sli slicing open the flesh of the madman's lifelike image, we are left with a, with a dissected corpus of bewildering complexity, an organic network incorporating dozens, if not hundreds, of biographical works. There's little apparent consensus among them regarding even the basic facts of, his, of the yogin's life. Details of the places he traveled, the individuals he trained as disciples, the songs he sang, even the dates of his life and death are all disputed. This is not to argue that such a thing as the historical Milarepa might not one day be exhumed. Indeed, an analysis, perhaps by means of a Milarepa seminar, on the model of a Jesus seminar, uh, comparing all the narratives of each version might yield such a result. It would be understandable, though, if the practitioner of such an operation, having peeled away uh, the flesh of the life's living corpus, felt as if the body had somehow vanished and like Sartre's Rokantan, were, ca were cast into a profound state of nausea. So to end here with a final anatomical metaphor, or a couple of them, the principal aim of uh, my book has been a kind of extended autopsy on the corpus that the madman crafted, a body that he made despite the fact, or perhaps because, Milarepa left no corporeal relics. An autopsy is not always performed at the time of death, but rather only in the event of some unnatural occurrence, an untimely death, an accident, a murder. Some abnormality must have turned up within the biographical corpus. What is unnatural in the case of the madman's creation is precisely that it appears so natural, it appears so real, it seems so close to its subject, to the point of being its subject. And yet it is a work composed centuries after its subject's death. So what seems wrong then is that this late work, a work so mediated, could appear so immediate as to cast centuries of biographical traditions into obscurity. The purpose of this book is not simply to bring those forgotten traditions back into the light, although that has also been one of its tasks, but to seek to understand why a work so late could appear so early, how a work so far removed from its subject could claim the point of origin. So in the end, calling this project a dissection, an autopsy, or a post-mortem, might be a little misleading since the body is not really dead. Calling it a vivisection would instead imply that the body was somehow murdered in the process. So perhaps then it might be thought of as a kind of, well, forgive me for this, uh, it might be thought of as a kind of biographical MRI, a multi-layered analysis of a living being for the corpus embodied in the madman's work certainly lives on. Milarepa did indeed live. He led many lives and remains a presence for the multitude of individuals who read his life story or bow their heads to his representation on a temple wall. He is continually born anew for modern day meditators who invoke the yogin's presence through prayer. But early translations also carried the life story into a fairly mainstream cross section of European and American culture. Milarepa's tradition is, of course, alive and well here in Boulder, as you all know. But the life of Milarepa has also been immortalized in several strip cartoons, numerous musical recordings, volumes of free verse, several novels, a French theatrical production, the Italian silver screen, and several other feature films. In one of baseball's great hoaxes, Renowned sports writer George Plimpton penned an article for Sports Illustrated describing the rookie player Sid Finch, whose incredible fastball was traced to his early tutelage under Tibet's great poet saint, Lama Milarepa. <laughs> so for centuries then after his death, 
authors have reimagined and rewritten versions of the yogin's life story. And those stories are his life. They form the corpus of narratives that embody his life both as an individual who traversed the Buddhist path to enlightenment, but also as an exemplar of how that might be accomplished. So thank you all very much. And I hope we have uh, some time for questions and discussion. Please, please. Um, Andy, I'm wondering um, something you just touched upon, a paradox about Milarepa's representation. I'm struck by, in your book, how you argue that Milarepa becomes more and more of an individual figure the farther and farther he gets from the sort of historical mm -hmm. origin of his biographical corpus. And could you speak to that kind of paradox of um, the sort of fictionalization of Milarepa as you describe it and his individuation? Because oftentimes we think of um, idiosyncrasies mm -hmm. in a biography as sort of historical evidence of, of a possible lived figure behind that tradition. And in this case, it feels like the details become more elaborated and distinct as the corpus grows, and particularly in Samyang Version. Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I think you've kind of touched upon this idea of the metaphor of the literary corpus, which begins as a uh, sort of non-individuated non representation. And this is what I'm thinking of as a kind of skeletal form. And it's really over time that it becomes more and more lifelike. You might say it becomes more and more realistic. Part of this uh, process could also be described as a kind of fictionalization, uh, which is an idea I kind of think about in the book itself, which is taken from Natalie Z. Davis's idea of fictionalizing, not in the sense of creating a falsi falsification, right, but of writing a story, of creating a, a kind of fiction, right, a, a kind of narrative, of crafting a narrative. And if there's anything you can say about Song Yun Haruka's um, role in crafting the figure of Milarepa is that he was a master narrativist. He was a master storyteller. And what he did was kind of work with the raw materials. You might say the bones and the flesh and the blood and created this incredible sort of lifelike and even living figure. One of the parts of the paradox is that this view, this picture of Milarepa developed so late, or developed 400 years after Milarepa died. And at that same time, um, there's very little kind of recognition or conscientiousness or even consciousness in the tradition, in the Tibetan tradition, of this vast corpus of early literature. It's all been forgotten. It's all been completely subsumed in this living image of Milarepa that Song Yun Haruka created. So I think that points to, uh, to the power of the figure that Milarepa has crafted. And it's one of the reasons I'm sort of thinking of it as a kind of living image. It's one of the ways in which he's breathed life into it. So the last piece I, I, I want to uh, uh, address, the, the, the last part of your question about the kind of idiosyncrasies of, of a life story. And it's true that Sonia Jaruka's version of Milarepa's life becomes kind of streamlined. It's such a beautiful narrative. It's such a novelized, kind of novelistic view of his life story. Um, it presents a kind of easy read. At the same time, there are all sorts of really wonderful, whimsical, kind of curious little accounts, right? And you wonder why they're there. I mean, we have this idea that hagiography was written basically for its ability to teach about the path to liberation and to inspire others uh, to, to follow that path. And yet there, there are little tidbits in Song Yun's, in Song Yun's text that have none of that about it. So one of my favorites is uh, when, uh, just after he's been sort of casting magic back in his homeland, and he's on the run, and he's trying to meet up with his, uh, with his assistant. And there's this account where they're at an inn, uh, local inn master near uh, Dingri. And he asks his assistant, uh, that the inn, inn, innkeeper asks the assistant, well, there's a group of yogis, and no, I haven't seen anyone like that, but there's a group of yogis in a kind of beer festival in the next village over. You should go there, and maybe you'll find him. Do you have a cup? Well, if you don't have a cup, I have a beautiful wooden cup, which is black on the outside like the face of Yama. And, I mean, this is a tiny little 
sort of nugget of information, but there's something so Tibetan about it, right? I mean, that the fact that this innkeeper would sort of wax eloquent about the properties of his cup, right? And this is one of those little tidbits that kind of, I don't know, shows you that this is a real story, right? What's curious is that also one of the pieces of his story uh, that actually doesn't appear in any of the earlier versions. So it seems to be one of the places that Sonny Haruk actually picked up on the existing oral tradition. So, all right, there's a question here. I was just going to say he, he sent his monks and disciples his Sangyums all, um, Sangyun sent them all over Tibet asking for the oral stories and collecting them. And that went on for some years, right? Yes. This is the, this is the account that we find in the biographies of Sangyun himself. And it's also, this is the sort of predominant understanding, even in kind of contemporary times, of how he wrote his text. But what's so interesting, and this is what I was trying to say here, that in reality, he based almost the entire thing on earlier, sort of previously ex existing uh, literature. And on his extraordinary lama. That's, that's right. That's right. So really, we can think of him more as an editor than as an author. Except for that he was such a great author. Like you said, he was such a great writer. Did you read all the biographies? Huh. Um, well, all, 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 all is a lot. So... <laughs> When you work with a tradition where one of the texts is called the 100,000 Songs, which is, no, no, I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm just, oh, of, of, well, so there are th three known uh, biographies, and yes, I looked through them all. I did. Thank you. Yes? Um, I had two things I wanted to just get more information about from them. Uh, the first was, you, you mentioned it briefly, another paradox, perhaps, that a large part of it, uh, Sanyun's sort of agenda in his time was to be critical mm -hmm. of institutionalized, corporatized religion. Right. And a big part of that was the Tuku institution. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, it's exactly the possibility that the, the, the reality that it is Milarepa in the flesh return that gives him this authority. Yes. So uh, I seem to remember something that Jeffrey Samuel said, possibly, where he cited Sanyo Iruka as having um, said that being recognized as a tuku was, was not important, yes. it didn't matter in a more general sense. But uh, so the first thing I wanted to ask is that maybe you could just say a bit more about that tension, mm -hmm. that contradiction, mm -hmm. and what exactly he had said right. about, about the institution. And then the other uh, thing was, you know, in the collected songs, I've been struck by the existence of these songs where it will say, uh, this was a song that Miller Repa sung when he was alone. Mm -hmm. um, this is a song he sang when he was lonely or when he was discouraged in his cave. No one was, no one is, so no one's there, right? So <laughs> given that you're talking about um, this sort of curious feature of, of, of being there as, as viscerally as you possibly could, um, but then also being at a remove of centuries, how, specifically those sorts of songs, I mean, mm -hmm. is there a way that you tie that into, into your sort of broader argument? I mean, I just wonder, because it made me think. Okay, so in the, in the second, well, I'll think about the second question since you just asked it, but I'm curious, are you asking, it, how is it possible that these, story, that these songs were written down if Millerape was, was alone in a cave somewhere and um, there was no one there to hear it? Or, about or? how it's possible, maybe how people have, con, have spoken about it, or, because you know, you've touched on already on, mm -hmm. on some of the mechanisms that allow that to be possible. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a complicated question, and I think uh, we don't know a whole lot about the process by which his gorbum, his collected songs, were, were put together. We know that they do appear that there is a, uh, a collected body of his songs that appear fairly early on, I think probably by the late 12th century, early 13th century. It's difficult to date these things with any precision, but that's my, my thinking. Um, they're far less structured than Tsongyun Haruka's collection is, and, but in many cases they're actually much bigger. So Tsongyun actually cut some things out from his collection, I think to make it sort of more manageable and to give it more structure. Um, one of the ways that I try to think about the collected songs in the book is to think about it as a kind of biographical network, as a network of sort of somewhat biographical cycles. So each chapter of the 100,000 songs is a kind of cycle, and it's, a prop it's called a cycle, a core 
in the Tibetan, but it is a proper kind of cycle. It's a group of songs or of reflections in, in poetry um, that are tied together by a kind of narrative frame. And often they're on a specific topic or it describes a meeting with a specific individual, specific disciple, sometimes it's several in, in individuals. But they give us some snippet of, of, of Milarepa's uh, life. And specifically, they fill in the period of Milarepa's life during uh, sort of from the, the period of his, you know, culminating moments in chapter 10 of the Namtar, of his liberation, if you will, and his death. So in the Namtar, in the biography, there's this mysterious chapter 11, which is basically a summary of all his teaching career. That whole teaching career is the subject of the collected songs. So the point of thinking about the songs as a biographic network is that uh, each of those song cycles tells us a little something or gives a little bit of information of Milarepa's teaching activities, and yet the order in which they appear is not really that important. Right? This, this is the story of Milarepa first encountering Gompopa. This is the story of Milarepa first encountering Shiwa. -e. It doesn't necessarily matter that they happen in a certain order. In fact, one of the things, one of the things Sonia Haruka does in his 100,000 songs, his collected songs, is cut and paste pieces from one cycle with another cycle and zipper them all together and he creates a totally new chapter about a new place. Right? So I think the actual order of them was not so important. What was important is that as a collective it creates this kind of network of all of the uh, activities that Milarepa carried out while he was teaching. So I'm not sure if that answered that part of the question, but let me think about the first part. Um, so I, I'm not sure where, wh which part of uh, uh, Jeffrey Samuel's kind of, uh, uh, writings you were uh, alluding to, but I think the, the reference is to a claim that E. Jean Smith once made, and one of the first things that was ever published about Sonia Haruka, this was back in the early 60s. So Gene Smith was one of the first people to really think about Sonia and his activities, his publication career, the idea of Nyumpas, these kind of crazy holy men and what they were about. And he found this one puzzling statement that Song Yun made uh, where he says something like, it, some people may have recognized me as a reincarnation of Tilopa, but actually that doesn't really matter very much. What matters is that you practice in this life. And so following upon, you know, Gene Smith admittedly pioneering work was that while Song Yun totally repudiated his status as Milarepa's reincarnation, but if you dig into Song Yun's own biographical tradition, you see it's, it runs throughout. And he even makes that kind of amazing claim on his own deathbed, right? Or he's said to have said this. Who knows if he actually said it. His disciples say that he made this claim that you have met Milarepa in, in the flesh. So, so other questions? Yes, here. Um, was there any skepticism around Song Yun's claims as the incarnation or to this authoritative force? considering the, yeah. the time difference yeah. between Milarepa's life and his life uh, as he's writing about this and of course writing in the first person right. gives him more authority or is this question more outside of your intent which looks more to fact or fiction? Right? Yeah, no, 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 that's actually, it, it's an important question and it's one I don't have an answer for. Certainly from all of the materials I've looked at, um, I haven't found any references to that. Um, but I think there's a, still a lot of work to be done on the, uh, on the life of Tsongyun Haruka, uh, Tsong Haruka, his activities, his milieu, his cohort, his own disciples, all of that. And luckily, we, we have another uh, fairly recent book that came out on, on Tsongyun's early life by Stefan Larson. Um, there's a new dissertation that will soon be a book uh, on the, uh, I don't know, on the kind of collective idea that emerged around Tsongyun's uh, time of the holy madman of uh, the Nyompa. Um, and this is by uh, David uh, Di Valerio, who's in Wisconsin now. So his dissertation was on this and that will soon be a book. And uh, hopefully this will, this will teach us more about the reception of Tsang Yun and other kinds of holy madmen outside of their, the, the close defines of their own disciples, who of course were supporting them. So, yes, here on the side. Um, I'm curious. <coughs> Is there any, um, does Sun Yun's own manuscript survive? Uh, we have no manuscripts of Tsong Yun's, mm -hmm. and we don't even have an extant copy of his original woodblock print, which is really perplexing. Mm -hmm. 
Do you have any idea what his writing life was like? I mean, it's sort of interesting to think of a guy who, you know, wears the bone ornaments and wears yeah. intestines around his neck and is yeah. meditating yeah. in caves, and he's not exactly got an iPad with him or anything. <laughs> I mean, at one point, is he settling in to, you know, yeah. really create a literary text and yeah. send out disciples, presumably to collect stories and bring back? And, I mean, it sounds like a workshop. Well, we do know a little bit about that, luckily. I talk about that a little bit in the book. Um, in fact, he complains about the difficulties, not necessarily of writing the stories, although we know that that was a long process. And he does talk about getting his disciples, sending them out to try and find you know, snippets of oral traditions. But the difficulties really lie in um, the printing. Printing was extraordinarily uh, lengthy, it was time consuming, it was labor intensive, and it was capital intensive. It was very expensive. Um, and so one of the things Song Yun basically had to do was go around and trying to find support for his publication uh, 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 projects. At one point, uh, he asks all of his disciples basically to turn in all of their material possessions. He basically says to, your, to, to his disciples, I need everything you got. Come on. I mean, otherwise this book will never get printed. And some of them actually revolt. I mean, they actually, they, they say, this is ludicrous. I mean, you've been working on this for years. You'll never finish. Why should we give you, you know, like that, that the sort of meager wealth that we own? And then the other disciple says, no, of course you can't do that. He's a Buddha. Come on, you're writing the life of Milarepa. Um, and eventually he has a vision of these uh, five goddesses of long life, the Tsering Chang'a, who says, well, you should actually go and ask for the patronage of this king of southern Tibet, and he'll help you out. And he does. Uh, and the king does, and the project is finished. So then what survives are reprints. They're, they're reprints. That's right. And how much later are those? Well, they begin uh, within about uh, 50 years or so. And then after that first printing, so I showed you the slides of this uh, uh, reprint from 1538. Um, Within, I don't know, a decade after that, there was another reprinting and then another reprinting. Many of them were actually made in southern Tibet, the areas in which Tsangyun was active and Milarepa was active. Um, but over the decades, there were, are at least 19 woodblock editions, um, and there are probably others as well. Other questions? There was one somewhere in the front. Yeah, way in the back. You have to shout so everyone can hear. Yeah, can hear me. Um, I'm curious. Like this idea of connecting the corpse and the corpus yeah. seems really compelling and appropriate here. Um, and I'm wondering, for those of us who don't work in hagiography or in Tibetan Buddhism, um, what do you think the extension of that idea is? Um, so for my own work, I certainly deal with texts that are interpreted and have a series of interpretations and have a sort of modern life and an ancient one. Um, but without the actual body there, is the vitality of that corpus undercut? So the degree of the question is, is your model here, is it specific to um, biography? Is it specific to Tibetan Buddhism? Um, how well does it translate outside of sort of a Buddhist uh, metaphysics where the bodily presence is authorizing something versus some other um, extraordinary? Right. So could everyone hear the question? Okay. Um, so that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think uh, one place to start in answering it is that in Tibet, like in many uh, parts of Buddhist Asia, um, books themselves were cultic objects. So texts contain a power beyond the stories that they contain. Right? So texts were kind of ritual objects that people would receive blessings from. They're used as consecration objects for stupas and for images. Um, there was a whole cult of the worship of books that began in India around the you know, time in which the Mahayana um, uh, literature began to be written, and that was followed in Tibet as well. So I read you that one uh, sort of phrase from the colophon of the life of Milarepa that this is a text that you can receive merit from not only by reading but from worshiping it, from touching it, from disseminating it. Right? So there's a real sort of kind of cultic presence here. Um, the story here of the uh, literary corpus as a physical corpse I think has a kind of certain kind of cachet or certain appeal with this story in particular because in the most famous telling, in Song Yun's telling, there are no relics, right? Milarepa has no physical relics, that they vanish. And it, it's kind of a perplexing story, right? Because, I mean, this is one of the crucial 
elements of the Buddha's life story and of Buddhist traditions across Asia, right, is that when teachers die, they leave relics. And the relics are the kind of living social presence or the living power uh, of the teacher that have a kind of social presence that can interact with students, that give blessings, that are the, are, are the source of authority, all sorts of miraculous things. And yet in this story of Milarepa, there are no relics, and that's really perplexing. And yet it's also a really important part of the story. So that was kind of a, a, a natural sort of opening to play with this idea of literary corpus and physical corpse. Now I should say that there are early versions of Milarepa's life in where, the, uh, where Milarepa is cremated, and there are relics. And the relics are, some are taken away and some are poured into the river so that everyone downstream from the river uh, you know, receives his blessings. And uh, there is also this famous traveling tour of uh, relics that the FPMT has been putting together for, for, for years now. I haven't seen it. It's coming to New York. I'm taking my students uh, in a couple of weeks to see it. But I've seen pictures of uh, these small like pearl relics that say, you know, relics of Milarepa. It would be interesting to hear the backstory of that, of how they, how they procured those. Oh, and one, one, one last thing. Uh, another sort of resonance of the way that Tibetan literature and biographical literature in particular has with this idea of relics is in something that I've thought quite a bit about and have recently published on. It's the use of texts as a literary relic, like the, the actual creation of literary relics. And this is not in texts as books so much as the texts of painting inscriptions. So as you probably know, there's this tradition of portable scroll paintings in Tibet called tankas, right? So you have the image on the front. There's almost always a ritual uh, for consecrating that image that imbues it with the living presence of its subject. So if it's a painting of the Buddha, you call in the, the living essence of the Buddha to reside within it. If you have a painting of Milarepa, you call in, ritually call in the essence, the kind of numinous essence of Milarepa to reside within it. And that creates a kind of empowered living image. Part of that ritual technology is the writing and scribing of uh, inscriptions on the back. And there's a really uh, wonderful and beautiful tradition of creating kind of uh, what do you call it, concrete poetry, the inscription of verses, but in specific shapes. And this is something that has not been studied much, although there was a really wonderful exhibition last year, maybe a few years ago, at the Rubin Museum called Flipside, which was intentionally looking at the backs of paintings. And what you see is that many of these consecration inscriptions are written in the shape of a stupa. So we all know what stupas are, right? Stupas began as reliquaries. And what do you put inside a stupa? You put relics inside stupas. And so uh, I've looked at certain examples, uh, especially in which the inscriptions are, bi are biographical texts and trying to think about ways in which those biographical texts actually become the relics that are interred within the kind of visual stupa there. So sort of two-dimensional literary relics as opposed to three-dimensional corporeal relics. So there's a lot uh, more work that could be done there. So thank you. Oh, yes, one late breaking question. Just a thought. Um, in listening to your presentation, really appreciate it. It's wonderful. Um, I had this uh, feeling that um, that almost that storytelling can be like a guru yoga practice, mm -hmm. and in this way, it infuses mm -hmm. life into the story. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that the this is m this might be the inspiration. Of Absolutely, I think that's a very important point. And we know that from the actual guru yoga liturgies, right? Often reflect on the lives of, of past teachers. One of the interesting sort of tie-ins to uh, Milarepa's biographical tradition is some of the earliest uh, biographical compendia, these really extensive collections of narratives and poetry of Milarepa, um, specifically refer themselves as part of a kind of tantric cycle, the tantric cycle of the Nyingyuda, these oral transmission lineages that extended from India to Marpa to Milarepa and Milarepa's uh, main disciples. So here's a biography, an extended biography of Milarepa that actually describes itself as part of a kind of broader tantric ritual and liturgical world. <laughs> 
And there are other authors uh, in medieval period, say the 13th, 14th century, who actually talked about the kind of preliminary uh, sections of a tantric curriculum consists of the biographies of past teachers. So there's a very direct kind of connection there. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you all again. And a few other thank yous that are in order to the Center for Asian Studies for um, sponsoring this as part of their speaker series, to the Sadra Foundation as co-sponsor and also donor of a wonderful set of Tibetan texts to the CU Libraries, um, to the CU Libraries for hosting um, this event and also the uh, wonderful exhibit, which if you haven't seen it on your way in, please go to the third floor and see it on your way out. Um, Andrew Violet, who is the designer here in the library, did such a wonderful job on that. To the CU Art Museum for their uh, exhibit um, that will be going on through much of October. Rubin Art Museum for um, some of their images, and there are many, many other credits um, that you can see on the wall of the library exhibit. So thank you all for coming and see some of you up in Keystone. Thank you.